Welcome to the EcoThink Podcast. I'm Yuko. And I'm Maya. And this is the podcast where you join us on a dive into climate change and social justice issues through a STEAM lens. Each episode, we will break down silos, build up amazement, and bring on action. Today, we are talking about how climate change is affecting species distribution of fish. We want to invite you to follow us on Instagram and Twitter at EcoThink Productions. If you would like to join the Eco Geeks in supporting this podcast, you can do that on Patreon at www.patreon.com forward slash EcoThink. Now, let's get into the show. Hey, Yuko. Hi, Maya. How you doing? Oh, I'm good. You know, just a <laughs> Is it weird things. that we're, you know, recording another hello, how are you, even though we just did this an episode ago? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> we- <laughs> and it's been a bit weird because I just scarfed down my dinner and did how it was it? Best. It was really, really tasty. Tell us all about it. Oh my gosh, it's an eggplant and beef dish with Mm -hmm. some rice and some squash, because it's squash season. Yum, yum, yum. And some roasted broccoli. Sounds delicious. Mm -hmm. I'll I'll hold the beef, thanks, but the rest of it sounds good. (laughs) It's a, the whole uh, meat industry can be a separate episode. Ooh, can I do that one? Yeah, the climate change and environmental impact of agriculture get ready to not want to (laughs) eat no that that is not the vibe we should be i know i know i know choose where to yes yes Yes, that is the important one but that's not what we're talking about today no we are talking about a different type of meat Yes, we're talking about fish. Um, Yeah, so today we're talking about specifically what is happening to fish because of climate change. And while there's a million things happening to fish because of climate change, but this one in particular is pretty interesting. And it's how ocean temperatures, rising ocean temperatures, and also like in lakes and um, watersheds and stuff, are affecting species distribution of fish. So what does that mean? Species distribution means where are those species found in the world? Um, If you were to look up a map of where certain species are most commonly found, um, it would probably show a bit of a, what's, what's that kind of thing where it's got like all the little numbers on the canvas and you paint each one? Paint by numbers? Yes, you could paint by numbers. (laughs) (laughs) I should know this. Anyway, (laughs) it kind of looks like a paint by numbers blob for each species in the entire world. And for fish, most species have pretty specific areas in the ocean that they prefer to be in. Right. So this is why if you go to a tropical location and go swimming, you We'll see completely different fish than if you were to brave the frigid waters um, of where we are <laughs> in Victoria, which even aren't that cold compared to some of the Arctic waters, which have entirely different fish altogether. So um, that's what species dis- distribution is. Now, Maya, yeah, does this only apply to fish? No, that is a good point. Um, Species distribution is something that happens for every species on this planet, whether that is terrestrial, um, fish, invertebrates that are living in the ocean as well also are affected by this. Um, Today I was just, I looked up the species distribution and the first thing that popped up was a couple of interesting topics to do with fish, so I kind of stuck with that. But um, terrestrial animals are also being pretty badly affected by this in um, interesting ways in that they're moving poleward so they're moving either to the north pole or to the south pole and this is actually happening much faster with fish which is why it's so interesting um because the way that the ocean acts with climate change is the ocean is the first thing that's really heating up um, because it's been kind of getting more and more thermal energy uh over the last 50 60 years ever since climate change has really started 
really, 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 really started taking off. I know it's been going for much longer than that, but that's kind of where a lot of this thermal sink has been happening. Because I don't know if you know this, Yuko, but the ocean is like one of the major um, CO2 sinks. Mm. It's like one of the major places where carbon dioxide is actually like sucked up like a sponge um, from the atmosphere, which is great. You know, that's amazing that it does that. Um, but it's also soaking up more than it should have to. Um, and the, that effect of having to deal with extra is causing problems for the ecosystems. This might be the child in me, but the first thing you said about the ocean being a sponge and it's sucking up more than it needs to, I thought of SpongeBob. Yes. There was this one episode where SpongeBob was sick, <clears throat> so then he plugged all of his pores. <laughs> <laughs> and it just created more problems. Oh, no. Is that an accurate visual of what our ocean is currently going through? You know what? Shockingly, yes. Because <laughs> it's awful. Yeah, well, but if you think about it, so basically what's happening, um, and I could do a whole separate mini-sode on this, is carbon sequestration, sequestration, say that five times fast, is a chemical process. Um, where basically carbon dioxide is being, it's not really sucked up. What it's happening is it's bonding with other chemical compounds that make, that are in the water, um, like calcium carbonate, for example. And what's happening is the little, what, what's this motion I'm doing with my hands? The little molecules. <laughs> capturing? <laughs> they're capturing, bonding. yeah, they're kind of bonding together and forming new, new compounds as this whole process is happening. And um, I'll get into it a little bit more in a mini episode, but basically once there's, once all of those little molecules have their carbon dioxide partners, there's none, there's nowhere else for the leftovers to go They're They kind of just have to hang out. And this causes issues in terms of like how much oxygen is actually available in the water for fish to use and other organisms, but fish as well. And it also, causes issues for specific animals who have to build a shell. It becomes harder for them to do through that same chemical process. And this, this is kind of what's under the term ocean acidification. I should have said that at the beginning, but mm -hmm. that'll be the mini-sode. Um, and basically all of this is happening concurrently with the heating up of the water itself. Um, and so this is where species distribution comes into play, specifically is with the heating up. Because when the water heats up, the fish that normally live there, they basically decide that they can't live there anymore, right? Very similar to how if you've ever tried to live a winter in Toronto, Canada, and <laughs> <laughs> you go, screw this, um, I'm leaving to somewhere not quite so terrible in the winter. Um, it's kind of the same process, but a little bit flipped in the sense that they don't want to be in warm water. If you are a cold water fish, when the water warms up for you, that's not a pleasant thing. They're not excited about that. They can't breathe as well. They can't metabolize um, their nutrients in the same way. It actually forces them to require more nutrients, which is harder for them to get. Um, and so the best thing that they can do for themselves is to move. And so mm -hmm. they move their species distribution poleward for most species, although there was an interesting um, article that was saying that not all species do this. Some species are actually moving to specific like cold pockets in the ocean because the ocean doesn't warm. Um, evenly. At the, yeah, it doesn't warm evenly. Exactly. Um, it's like a microwave. <laughs> <laughs> a microwave versus an oven. <laughs> exactly. And yeah, where was I going with that? So the, the fish will move to get to colder waters because that makes sense for them. Like it's like, okay, now I can live here again. But what happened? Like, where are they going? They're going to a place that isn't empty of fish. There's already fish living there. And so this is a, a problem in some respects, in the sense that those new fish are now having to compete for resources with fish that were already living there before, and those fish have to now compete with these resources that the new fish 
are wanting to also have. And so it's this weird new ecosystem that's being born in front of our eyes and the dynamic of native fish versus incoming fish and like which one's going to survive can they cohabitate can do they have to be separated is it even possible to separate them these are all questions that people are still trying to figure out so i actually got into a i wouldn't call it an argument it was a bit of a tense conversation <laughs> Okay. <laughs> about about ocean warming and species distribution cuz th- I think the topic came about when we were talking about that barracuda that was caught off of the oh, coast yeah. of our island. Yes, okay. Yeah, and I was I was saying like, "Oh, this is not a good sign. It means our it means our local waters, the Salish Sea, the Pacific Ocean, it means it's warming up. That's a not good news for for example, for the animals that can't move like our glass sponges, they can't mm-hmm. move. Yeah. Warm water is not good for them. But then this gentleman was saying, "But that's so cool. We're going to get brand new species off our coast." <laughs> and I kind of got into a space where I'm like, "How do I explain to him that that's not a good thing? Novel species aren't a great thing for our ecosystem. It's definitely, Mm -hmm. so it's interesting, right? Because you're right. It it causes an upheaval in the current ecosystem. Um, And we don't really know what it's going to look like. Like there's no way of telling, right? Like back in, Mm -hmm. um, even as, as late as the 1980s, it was still the common scientific knowledge was more biodiversity is good so introduce new species introduce novel species that's good right and like people Mm -hmm. believed that and we are still to this day learning the ramifications of introducing a new species into an ecosystem and how that can completely change things and yeah like so for the species that can't move super easily so a lot of invertebrates or a lot of um sessile which means they can't move um species like sponges and corals they are going to be drastically affected by this um i the thing is is that we're also going to have to come up against the fact that this is just going to be happening Mm -hmm. um unfortunately we can't put a refrigerator (laughs) In the ocean. Um, what are you talking about? Throw some coolant in there. <laughs> I mean, don't do that. Please don't yeah, do that. Yeah. And, and so it's, it's one of those things where we're kind of stuck between a rock and a hard place because, yes, we don't want this to happen. It's not a great thing for a barracuda to show up in our, in, off the coast of Victoria because that is a fish that normally lives much further south. Um, but that fish had to move north because where it was living originally was too warm for it. Um, And that is a process that has been happening over the past 10, 20 years, and it will continue happening even if we were to shut off all carbon emissions in the entire world today. It will continue happening for the next several decades until things balance out. So the question really becomes, what do we do in the meantime? You know, how do we make sure that the biodiversity we currently have, how do we make sure that these ecosystems we currently have are protected in a way that allow us to find that equilibrium again in the future? Because unfortunately, at least from what I'm reading, (laughs) it's going to change. And so how we help mitigate some of the change and also adapt to the change that will happen is going to be a big question. And um, that brings me to a, like a human social issue point in that this is affecting the fishing industry a lot. Um, You know, there are people who, like you said, there's like barracuda caught off of our coast. There was also a sunfish, or no, a sailfish, sorry, a sailfish caught in Cape Cod, which is Northeastern United States. Sailfish, are a tropical species. <laughs> like they are usually found in the Caribbean. <laughs> um, so for one to be found basically in Maine, United States, is 
That's just unheard of. God. It's insane. And also, that's not the only one, but in Portugal, they've caught 20 new species that they have never caught before. They caught 20 different species in that region over the last few years in Portugal. Um, and this isn't just happening kind of like all along our area, but also in the Arctic, we're noticing that Chinook salmon, salmon, Chinook salmon, uh, <laughs> <laughs> Chinook salmon is moving further north to Arctic rivers that they have never really entered before. So they're actually going into brand new rivers to um, lay their eggs and spawn that were not historically their, the rivers that they would go to. They're going further and further north. And so these are all things that are coming into how we as humans who want to fish fish and, you know, sustainable fishing is a completely different episode. But the fact of the matter is, is that the species that people are fishing are now different. And so if you are a fisherman, um, whether that be a commercial fisherman or a, a lone fisherman in your little boat, if you are a fisherman and you go out expecting to catch cod and you come back with a sailfish, you have to start asking yourself some questions. You know, what do you do when that happens? And also, what is the social response to that? You know, is there a market for sailfish in Cape Cod? If, like, or would it just be thrown back into the water? Is it just bycatch? Or is it something that, like, okay, well, I mean, it's caught. Like, what do we do with that? And so there's this big question of how will fisheries respond to this and how will they make it so that they can manage those risks to the industry while also making sure that they're moving forward with becoming more sustainable because there's a whole other issue with sustainable fishing being very, very important. Yeah, it's, it's fascinating. I, I need an illustrated comic of a fisherman going out expecting like salmon yeah but catching a tropical sailfish like <laughs> i need that comic yes <laughs> someone who can draw can you please illustrate this for us <laughs> yeah yeah exactly that's that's crazy and i imagine i imagine that species who are moving forward their territory or like the range that they usually have is starting to shrink as well so the amount of space that they can occupy and the amount of space that they can swim in like due to the water temperature, like that's going to shrink. And wh what is, what are the ramifications of their space shrinking? Like obviously their population is going to drop dramatically because they don't have enough space to support them. Mm -hmm. And this is not even thinking about the competition for food with yeah. other species. Yeah, it's a big issue. Mm -hmm. um, I think something to keep in mind when it comes to this topic of ocean warming is that it's not like these species can just go back. It's not like they can just get, like, it's not like they can just decide they want to move back to Florida. You know, like it's, <laughs> that's not really how it works because what happens is the water, when it gets really warm, it becomes unlivable. Like there's very little oxygen available um, in that warm temperature water. Mm -hmm. um, and this is, you can see this very clearly in terms of the, um, just the way that species distribution works. Like in colder water, you tend to get a much larger biodiversity of invertebrates and things that require a um, calciferous or a calcium based shell. You get a lot more of that. Whereas in warmer water, you tend to get a slightly more select grouping mm -hmm. um, of animals that are well adapted to it. And well, that being said, yeah. water chemistry does depend on the temperature. So it's really interesting that you brought up like more biodiversity in colder waters. Well, a big part of it is due to um, available oxygen, nutrients, and also salinity of the water is also yes. different yeah. between um, warm and cold water. Yeah. Um, and that, and if you, if we look at fish specifically, specifically, <laughs> anyways, <laughs> um, if you look at fish specifically, 
<laughs> uh, fish has a very, they have a very particular physiology um, yes. on how they uh, regulate not only salt and nutrients, but also like how they regulate how much water that they are intaking. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Right. And with changing, te- so they are different species are adapted to a certain salinity level. Yes. So if the water temperature changes, it also changes the salinity level, which means that that species of fish may not be able to regulate the salt content in their body. And that Mm -hmm. in turn affects um, different pathways Mm -hmm. um, in their system, like their pathways for energy production, their pathways for nutrient uptake. That's all affected by uh, the salt level. So it's, this is why they can't go back to colder. This is why they can't move back. (laughs) Well, exactly. And I don't know if I mentioned this before, so stop me if I did, but um, I'm just like reviewing my notes here. And basically when the, when there's a reduction in oxygen in warmer waters, um, something that also happens to the fish is that they end up with a higher metabolic rate in warmer waters, which requires them to get more oxygen. And yet they're living in a place that has less oxygen. And so it's this really weird negative feedback loop that forces them in order to survive to move to a place that matches their adaptations. So it's, it's a big issue. And it's how we're going to respond to it is, as humans with desires for fishing industry is also a big deal. You know, like fisheries are going to have to really take this into account in their planning, you know? Mm-hmm. And they're going to have to think about how, you know, this, you're going to have to be able to write permits for barracuda fishing off the coast of Victoria. Like that's something that's going to have to be discussed. Um, And, and it sucks too, because obviously we'd like to stop it, but it's not something that stops within a couple of weeks or a couple of years. This is something that's going to take a while to fix. And I do think that we can fix it. I do think I, I am a positive person that fully believes that if the human people of this planet will get together and actually get our stuff on track to reduce emissions and all that jazz, I do believe we can fix it. But it, it's going to take a few decades. Take a while, yeah. It's going to take a while. And, um, and in the meantime, you know, what can we do? We can make sure that those species that are being affected are affected, are protected and preserved Mm -hmm. if they need to be making sure that there's genetic material saved so that we could possibly bring them back you know like all that kind of stuff i think that is there's a lot to be said for the scientific effort in that conservation that's going on right now so i noticed you said the human people what about (laughs) the lizard people of our society oh the lizard people already have themselves figured out (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> but that, but their equation doesn't involve us, the human. Oh, yeah. Well, that, can you blame them? <laughs> you can take this out of the podcast. I'm sorry. <laughs> nah, man, the weird stuff stays in. <laughs> I'm just like, this is <laughs> Yuko's, uh, not cor- not conscription. What's the word of like controversial topics? <laughs> Um, but t- going back to like the social the social issues that new species bring up, did you look into how this might affect indigenous fishing practices? So I didn't look into that specifically, although I did come across um, several articles that pointed out quite rightly that commercial fishing industry is going to be able to adapt to this much faster and with more success than small local efforts and if that includes indigenous fishing practices then that's also the case because they tend to have smaller vessels and have fewer people kind of doing it Mm -hmm. um so yes it's going to affect indigenous fishing practices disproportionately more um, than commercial fishing practices i say that's i can say for sure that that is something Mm -hmm. that will probably happen in terms of how we manage that to make sure that those traditional practices can continue um, into the future or at the very least have those species conserved and preserved and and all of the things that require that are required for them to be able to survive this issue um you know it may 
I would be really interested to talk to an expert on that because I don't know what people are calling for in that space. Um, from the outside, it seems obvious to me that we'd want to maybe switch tactics to focus on conserving those species for now and then at some later date hope to be able to reopen those fisheries. Mm -hmm. But it's, you know, it's hard to say. Like this is, it also involves people's livelihoods. So, and I know that that's, you know, that's a touchy subject. It's one thing to say, oh yeah, we should just stop right now. But it's another thing to say that to somebody who like, this is literally how they put food on their table. Um, so hopefully we can find someone who's willing to talk to us about that. I think that would be a really fascinating topic for a future episode. Yeah, I agree. I always find anything to do with fishing and fisheries and ex essentially extracting resources from our ocean. Yeah. It's always going to be a touchy subject because so many people's livelihoods depend on it. And at the beginning of these industries, there wasn't the thought of implementing sustainable practices in definitely not because, yeah because the thought was this will always be here exactly like yeah, for sure yeah <laughs> <laughs> like i i'm kind of going to veer off topic a little bit for it but, um, when i was i was studying fisheries management it was one of my electives in university and i was learning all of these equations that most fisheries use to kind of determine how much yield so how much they can actually fish out every year like their quotas and so many of the variables in that equation you just don't know like one of the variable i remember was what is the population of salmon of chinook salmon in this location you don't know how many yeah. salmons you there can, are uh, you can guesstimate you know like but that's literally all it is is they're using guesstimations mm -hmm. yeah. it's not an accurate science because we don't know yeah. how many individuals are left or how many are in the population. And so it's just like it, with species distribution, this information will change from what we know. And then you also have to think of, okay, now how are we going to measure what the population is now, now that we are not sure how far the species travel up yeah. towards the poles and yeah. will they even come back down well and it's also an interesting point as well in terms of how they travel and how that affects fishing mm -hmm. i mean newsflash fish don't give a crap about borders mm -hmm. you know they are not they, they they are not owned by countries as much as we like to draw lines on maps it, you know the the fish that you fish out of the ocean here, depending on the species, could very well have traveled all the way up to Alaska and back down. And or it could have traveled in the opposite direction down to California and back up. Mm. You know, like there's it, it goes across borders. And so species distribution is also affecting this issue in the sense that if there is a industry, a fishing industry that is traditionally catching i'll say alaskan salmon again right because that is something that comes up here locally like where are those salmon going to go in the future and what does that mean for the people actually fishing it out of the ocean and getting paid for that and people eating it and where is it getting shipped to like you know fish seafood provides a big percentage of the consumed calories of the world. You know, it's one of those things that it's a massive food source um, for the human species. And this is tied up in fishing rights, in border disputes. This is, it affects all of those things. Yeah, so, and I don't have the answers. And I think people are, people much smarter than me still don't have the answers. But I, I do think that there are things that we can do individually as uh, people listening to this podcast, though. I 100% agree. Like our borders, our country borders, our province borders, they're not sectioned off by climate or 
biomes. It's exactly. Not, it's honestly, maybe I've just been so ingrained in ecology and biology that I look at our world map and I'm like, this distribution doesn't make sense. This border doesn't make sense. Yeah. All of, for example, all of Pacific Northwest extends from California to Alaska. We're <laughs> all we all share similar species and weather and climate. Mm-hmm. It doesn't make sense that we're separated by borders. Oh, yeah. Well, and if anyone's done a road trip down to California, you can very clearly see a line where Mother Nature was like, this is the actual border between North and South California, because that's where the biome changes. Yeah. (laughs) You're just like, oh, okay. Like, it's very stark where Mm -hmm. you leave the Pacific Northwest and then you enter, like, desert and, you know, far more... um, I don't even know what that biome's called, man. Oh, I've been so focused, educate me. <laughs> I've been so focused on Pacific Northwest that everything else is outside of the bubble. Oh my gosh! Yeah, <laughs> someone from a different ecosystem, educate me, please. Mm-hmm. Um, I've been I've been looking at the world based on ecosystems, and it's fascinating. Mm-hmm. But you also can't forget, like we are humans. We do need to pay attention to our human borders. Yeah. Well, and it, and it's interesting how it makes us interact with the ecosystems. It does, yeah. Yeah. Like our environmental regulations up in BC completely different than down in Washington. For sure. Yeah. But we share we share literally all of the same species. They have Gary Oaks, we have Gary Oaks, like Yeah. yeah. And that's that's like two completely different countries. So yeah. <laughs> as much as some people might like to say Canada is just another part of the U.S., I'm here to tell you it is not. Canada is another part of – no, U.S. is another part of Canada. <laughs> okay. Mm, we don't don't, mm, don't mm. come for me. Don't come for me. Um, anyways, back to fish. So, yes. So kind of bridging that gap between human borders and jurisdiction and the fish's natural migration path. It's it's very it's a very difficult question, especially when new species come into play. Mm-hmm. Like we're we I know we are already having issues with, um, our, like up here in BC we may have a, a quota. Yeah. Um, but down the states they might be able to fish more or less than what we can fish up here. Yeah. What does that mean for the overall population of mm-hmm. that species? Yeah. Well, it means that it is being affected in ways that no one jurisdiction can control. Mm-hmm. Um, and so I'll, I'll mention the Alaskan salmon problem yet again. Those Alaskan salmon are the exact same salmon that go up our rivers in the Fraser Valley. Mm-hmm. And, you know, in the Fraser Valley, there's a lot of people who are working really hard to try and improve the salmon population. But once they leave the Fraser Valley and they make their journey up to Alaska, that is where a huge percentage of them are fished. And I'm not well versed on the Alaskan fishing issues. I know that there are a lot of very vocal proponents for keeping the fishery going. And, you know, it's definitely a big moneymaker for people who rely on it. So I know that it's a touchy issue. Um, but the fact of the matter is, is that the efforts being put into improving the salmon population in the Fraser Valley are being directly impacted by the fishing industry in Alaska, which is, a di- again, it's a completely different country. So different laws, different jurisdictions, um, and there's no control over that. So what I think we need is we need cross-jurisdictional efforts to improve and protect and conserve these populations as much as possible. Mm -hmm. Um, And there are efforts being done into that. I mean, there's a lot of um, the NGO that you currently work for and that I used to work for back in the 90s did a big effort in um, harvesting genetic material, aka eggs and sperm, from salmon in the Fraser Valley in order to preserve them in case it was needed and it was needed just last year, I think, or a year and a half ago, they used that genetic material to actually successfully introduce new salmon, new genetic stock into that Fraser Valley in order to help it um, recover, which is insane. Like this is, this is stuff from the nineties, which is already 30 years ago. feels like yesterday, but (laughs) there you go. Um, And 
so that's the kind of work that I'm talking about here when it comes to conserving these species. And I know it's not the be all end all to just, you know, harvest a bunch of genetic material and put it in a fridge somewhere, but it does help. And, or at least I hope it helps. <laughs> I mean, that's what a lot of places like zoos and museums and aquariums, that's, that's what they do. Um, yeah. the, that's what they are, do now. Yeah. That's what they do now. Yeah. yeah. A lot of these facilities that, used to be for you know for people's entertainment and whatnot a lot of effort has been made to preserve those genetic materials so that in the case that due to anthropogenic shortcomings that is a different. super polite way of putting it <laughs> i know I was trying anthropogenic to like, shortcomings, shortcomings. <laughs> mm. i feel like there's there's a t-shirt saying in that one you know i feel like <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's like I can't come to work due to anthropogenic shortcomings. <laughs> oh, I, I really like that quote. <laughs> yeah, we're sa- I'm saving that. No one steal it from me. It's fine. <laughs> but because, like, we save those genetic materials so that we can bring the population back up in yes. the case of extinction. Yes, the big E extinction. Well, and it's and it's not. It is by no means replacing or Mm -hmm. intended to overshadow other conservation efforts. And I know that we've completely left the species distribution topic, but just (laughs) a quick note on this because it bothers me so much is when, when talking about a solution or an effort like conservation of genetic material for a species at risk. Often people will argue against it saying, oh, but we should be doing this other thing. And in my opinion, me telling you that it's important to conserve the genetic material just in case was not me saying that you shouldn't also do this other conservation effort. It's not mutually exclusive. It's not mutually exclusive. And using that as an argument completely derails everybody and causes the entire effort, all of the different solutions that are being put forward to not be as successful as they could be. So we need to stop living in silos and we need to stop separating each other. We need to start coming together and acknowledging that all of these are pieces of the puzzle and they all need, they all need to be given their due diligence for sure. Like I don't mm-hmm. think anyone should be doing it in the, in, in any kind of half-assed way but you know we're not going to solve these problems with one single silver bullet that doesn't exist we need all of them give me all the bullets give me all the bullets (laughs) rent over (laughs) i'll leave it at silver bullets (laughs) and you know what like the fact that we always deviate from the main topic is because everything is connected it is it truly which is. is which is why it's really hard just to talk about species distribution in one context oh for sure and i would love to come back to it mm -hmm. like i'm i foresee us coming back to this when we talk more about fisheries yeah for sure if we want to touch that controversial (laughs) (laughs) leave us a comment if you want us to talk about fisheries Um, yeah we promise to do it in a way that it looks at all the different sides to it because again there's some is some tricky stuff, but it's an they interesting are, yeah. conversation to have. When people's money when people's money is involved or are involved, it's it makes everything more complicated because this is yeah. you're literally talking about people's livelihoods. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. And before we move on, I want to because I realize my workplace does a lot of good work. I really shouldn't hide it. It's so the the NGO that Maya used to work for and that I currently work for is called World Fisheries Trust. Mm -hmm. Uh, We are based out of Victoria and we do do a lot of really wonderful conservation work locally and internationally. And we have a great education portfolio that is still still improving every day. Yeah, um, the education portfolio has a different name, Sequaria Ocean Education. So you should definitely go check them out at www.seaquaria.com. 
ca.org.org. Org. <laughs> .org. <laughs> I was so focused on spelling it that I forgot mm-hmm. the the dot com thing. Dot org. And if, whatever. <laughs> <laughs> and if you want to learn more about the conservation efforts and the different research projects that World Fisheries Trust is doing locally in Victoria, check out coastalcollabsci.org. That's Costa, C-O-A-S-T-A-L, collab, C-O-L-A-B, sci, S-C-I dot org. Yes. Mm-hmm. Yeah, they, you guys are doing some really great work, and I, I, miss, I miss working with the team over there. They're pretty darn cool people. So It's literally an office full of nerds nerding out about oh, different nerdy topics. Yeah. Um, yeah, maybe we should get one of them on here to do an interview. Mm-hmm. Yes. Like yes. talk about species distribution for Olympia oysters. Ooh. Yeah, that'd be so cool. <laughs> I do have to, like, now that you brought it up, Olympia oysters is the only native oyster species on the coast um, of Vancouver Island. And mm-hmm. they're like this really adorable, tiny little oysters. <laughs> and I didn't realize invertebrates can brood their babies, like brood like, like a like head. Like they carry brood. their babies. Yeah, like a hen brooding her eggs. Yeah. But these Olympia oysters, they literally carry their babies in their shells. <laughs> it's and also they switch sexes every year. Yeah. They go from male to female. And it's like, yeah. They're so yeah. woke. They're so <laughs> <laughs> I was gonna say they have commitment issues and I, I identify with that. <laughs> That's awesome. Yeah. So um, I kind of wanted to wrap up this conversation by yes. uh, leaving us off on a bit of an action item, a bit of a positive note. So I just wanted to say that if you're feeling a little bit weirded out by all the species distribution stuff with fishing, um, some things that you can do um, as a person listening to this podcast is see or a what lizard you can, person or a lizard person, <laughs> a human person or a lizard person. Um, If you can, if you're in an area that has this available, see if you can find a local fisherman that you can support. Um, So whether this means searching around online or going down to the docks or um, talking to your friends to see if anyone knows who's going out fishing, see if you can purchase your seafood locally um, and also from someone who's doing it on a slightly smaller, more sustainable scale, because those are the people that are going to need your help um, moving forward. Another thing that you can do if that's not available to you, whether you're, if, if you're in the interior of Canada or you're just not about going down to the docks, I see you, you are valid. Um, you can look up the Ocean Wise Sustainable Seafood Guide. This is an amazing resource put out by the Vancouver Aquarium uh, program called Ocean Wise. It's all one word, Ocean, O-C-E-A-N, Wise, W-I-S-E. And they have a sustainable (laughs) seafood guide. Yuko is wearing their uh, hoodie. And basically it tells you what species of seafood is um, safe to eat in the sense that it's not going to harm the ecosystem, either because it's been identified as fairly common and so it's okay to eat them. Um, And it will also tell you which ones to avoid because they are at risk and they need to be not fished super heavily. So you can avoid supporting fishing of those species. Um, So yeah, I recommend checking that out as an awesome resource. They also have a lot of really good information on their website about ocean issues. So check out OceanWise. Thank you for listening to this episode of the EcoThink Podcast. We hope you enjoyed learning something with us today. The EcoThink Podcast is an official podcast of EcoThink Productions. You can find past episodes on ecothinkproductions.com forward slash podcast. You can support this podcast by following us on Instagram and Twitter at EcoThink Productions. And join the Patreon on patreon.com forward slash EcoThink. Thank you, and we'll talk to you soon.